in this module we shall discuss about total factor productivity and economic growth colonial americans were very poor by today's standard of poverty on the eve of american revolution gdp per capita in the united states stood at approximately 765 us dollar in 1992 incomes rose dramatically over the next two centuries propelled upward by the industrial revolution and by 1997 gdp per capita had grown to 26847 us dollar this growth was not always smooth but it has been persistent at an average annual growth rate of 1.7% moreover the transformation brought by the industrial revolution moved americans of the farms to jobs in the manufacturing and increasingly the service sector of the economy understanding this great transformation is one of the basic goals of economic research theorists have responded with a variety of models marxian and neoclassical theories of growth assign the greatest weight to productivity improvements driven by advances in technology and the organization of production on the other hand the new growth theory and another branch of new classical economics the theory of capital and investment attach primary significance to the increase in investments in human capital knowledge and fixed capital the dichotomy between technology and capital formation carries over to empirical growth analysis generally speaking the empirical growth economists had two main tasks first to undertake the enormous job of constructing historical data on inputs and outputs and second to measure the degree to which output growth is in fact due to the technological factors that is productivity versus capital formation this last undertaking is sometimes called sources of growth analysis and is the intellectual framework of the tfp residuals which is the organizing concept of this survey after studying this module you shall be able to know the concept of total factor productivity to understand the correlation between tfp and the energy conversion efficiency learn about the importance of residual in the concept of total factor productivity let us first discuss total factor productivity in detail total factor productivity is the portion of output not explained by the amount of inputs used in production as such its level is determined by how efficiently and intensively the inputs are utilized in production in economics total factor productivity tfp also called multi factor productivity is a variable which accounts for effects in total output not caused by traditionally measured inputs of labor and capital if all inputs are accounted for then total factor productivity can be taken as a measure of an economy's long term technological change or technological dynamism tfp cannot be measured directly instead it is a residual often called the solo residual which accounts for effects in total output not caused by inputs the equation in cobb douglas form represents total output as function of total factor productivity a capital input k labor input l and two inputs respective shares of output alpha and beta are the capital input share of contribution for k and l respectively an increase in either a k or l will lead to an increase in output while capital and labor inputs are tangible total factor productivity appears to be more intangible as it can range from technology to knowledge of workers that is human capital y is equal to a k raised to the power alpha and l raised to the power beta technology growth and efficiency are regarded as two of the biggest subsections of total factor productivity the former possessing special inherent features such as positive externalities and non trivialness 
विच एनहांस इट्स पोजिशन एज ए ड्राइवर ऑफ इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ टोटल फैक्टर प्रोडक्टिविटी इज ऑफन सीन एज द रियल ड्राइवर ऑफ ग्रोथ विद इन द इकोनॉमी एंड स्टडीज रिवील दैट वाई लेबर एंड इन्वेस्टमेंट आर इंपॉर्टेंट कंट्रीब्यूटर्स टोटल फैक्टर प्रोडक्टिविटी मे अकाउंट फॉर अप टू सिक्सटी परसेंट ऑफ ग्रोथ विद इन इकोनॉमीज टी एफ पी इज मोर एक्यूरेटली मेजर्ड इन लॉन्ग टर्म सिंस टी एफ पी कैन वेरी सब्सटेंशियली फ्रॉम वन ईयर टू अनदर इट हैज बीन शोन दैट देर इज ए हिस्टोरिकल कोरलेशन बिटवीन टी एफ पी एंड एनर्जी कन्वर्जन एफिशेंसी टी एफ पी ग्रोथ इज यूजली मेजर्ड बाई सोलो रेजल लेटस जी वाई डिनोट्स द ग्रोथ रेट ऑफ एग्रीगेट आउटपुट जी के द ग्रोथ रेट ऑफ एग्रीगेट कैपिटल जी एल द ग्रोथ रेट ऑफ एग्रीगेट लेबर एंड अल्फा द कैपिटल शेयर द सोलो रेजल इज देन डिफाइंड एज जी वाई माइनस अल्फा जी के माइनस वन माइनस अल्फा इंटू जी एल द सोलो रेजल एक्यूरेटली मेजर्स टी एफ पी ग्रोथ इफ नंबर वन द प्रोडक्शन फंक्शन इज न्यू क्लासिकल नंबर टू देर इज परफेक्ट कॉम्पिटिशन इन फैक्टर मार्केट एंड नंबर थ्री द ग्रोथ रेट्स ऑफ द इनपुट्स आर मेजर्ड एक्यूरेटली टी एफ पी प्लेज ए क्रिटिकल रोल ऑन इकोनॉमिक फ्लक्चुएशन इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ एंड क्रॉस कंट्री पर कैपिटल इनकम डिफरेंसेज एट बिजनेस साइकिल फ्रीक्वेंसीज टी एफ पी इज स्ट्रांगली कोरलेटेड विदाउट पुट एंड आर्स वर्क द टी एफ पी मॉडल प्रोड्यूस एन एक्सप्लेनेशन ऑफ इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ बेस्ड सोलली ऑन प्रोडक्शन फंक्शन एंड द मार्जिनल प्रोडक्टिविटी कंडीशन दस इट इज नॉट ए थ्योरी ऑफ इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ बिकॉज इट डज नॉट एक्सप्लेन हाउ वेरिएबल्स ऑन द राइट हैंड साइड ऑफ द प्रोडक्शन फंक्शन लेबर कैपिटल एंड टेक्नोलॉजी इवॉल्व ओवर टाइम हाउ solo himself provided an account of this evolution in a separate and slightly earlier paper he assumed that labor and technology were exogenous factors determined outside the model and that investment is a constant fraction of output then if technical changes entirely labor augmenting and the production function is well behaved the economy converges to a steady state growth path along which both output per worker and capital per worker grows at the rate of technical change cos 1965 and koopman 1965 arrive at essentially the same conclusion using different assumption about the saving investment process both of these new classical growth models produces a very different conclusion from that of the tfp model about the importance of technical change in economic growth in the new classical growth models capital formation explains none of the long run steady state growth in output because capital is itself endogenous and driven by technical change technical innovation causes output to increase which increases investment which thereby induces an expansion in the stock of capital this induced capital accumulation is the direct result of tfp growth and in steady state growth all capital accumulation and output growth are due to tfp while real world economics rarely met meet the conditions for steady state growth the induced accumulation effect is present outside steady state conditions whenever the output affects the tfp growth generates a stream of new investments moving on to the measurement of tfp the residual is a valid measure of the shift in the production function under the solo assumptions however because the tfp residual model treats all capital formation as a wholly exogenous explanatory factor it tends to overstate the role of capital and understate the role of innovation in the growth process since some part of the observed rate of capital accumulation is a tfp induced effect it should be counted along with tfp in any assessment of the impact of innovation on economic growth only the fraction of capital accumulation arising from the underlying propensity to invest at a constant rate of tfp growth should be scored as capital independent contribution to output growth the distinction between the size of the residual on the one hand and its impact on growth on the other has been generally ignored in the productivity literature this oversight has come back to haunt the debate over assimilation versus accumulation as the driving force in economic development a number of comparative growth studies have found that the great success of the east asian tiger was driven mainly by the increase in capital and labor rather than by tfp growth 
with diminishing marginal returns to capital the dominant role of the capital implies that the east asian miracle is not sustainable and must ultimately wind down however these conclusions do not take into account the induced capital accumulation effect the role played by the tfp growth is actually larger and the saving investment effect is proportionately smaller new classical growth models assume that innovation is an exogenous process with the implication that investment in r and d have no systematic and predictable effort effect on output growth but can it really be true that the huge amount of r and d investment made in recent years was undertaken without any expectation of gain a more plausible approach is to be abandoned the assumption that the innovation is exogenous to the economic system and to recognize that some part of innovation is in fact a form of capital accumulation this is precisely the view incorporated in endogenous growth theory of romer and lucas the concept of capital is expanded to include knowledge and human capital and is added to conventional fixed capital thus arriving at total capital increments of knowledge are put on an equal footing with all other forms of investment and therefore the rate of innovation is endogenous to the model the key point of endogenous growth theory is not however that r and d and human capital are important determinants of output growth what is new in endogenous growth theory is the assumption that the marginal product of capital is constant not diminishing as in the new classical theories it is the diminishing marginal return to capital that bring about convergence to steady state growth in the new classical theory and conversely it is constant marginal returns that cause the induced accumulation effect on capital to on ad infinitum most of the tfp studies that have incorporated product oriented innovation into the residual have focused on capital embodied technical change nelson in 1964 expressed the residual as a function of the rate of embodiment and the average age of the capital stock domer 1963 and jorgensen 1966 observed that capital is both an input and an output of the production processes and the failure to measure capital in efficiency units causes two types of measurement error one associated with the mismeasurement of capital input and one with the mismeasurement of investment good out surprisingly the two errors exactly cancel in golden rule steady state growth leaving the residual unbiased once it is recognized that product quality adjustment allow consumer welfare parameters to creep into the tfp residual the boundary between the supply side conception of the residual and the demand side interpretation is blurred if welfare considerations are permitted inside one region of the supply side boundary and they must be if the quality dimensions of output is to make sense perhaps they should be permitted in other boundary area such as the net versus gross output controversy where welfare argument have also been made after all a high rate of real gdp growth and hence a large gross output productivity residual can be sustained then the short run by the depleting irreproducible resources at the expense of long run welfare net output solves this problem by controlling for depreciation and environmental damage some believe that it thus provides a more accurate picture of sustainable long run economic growth does it not follow that a separate tfp residual based on net output is the appropriate indicator of the contribution of costless technical innovation is sustainable growth the short answer is no changes in social welfare can be shown to depend on the standard gross output concept of tfp with no need to define a net output variant of tfp tfp residual can in principle be computed for every level of economic activity from the plant floor to the aggregate economy these residuals are not independent of each other because for example the productivity of a firm reflects the productivity of its component plants similarly industry residuals are 
related to those of the constituent firms and productivity in the aggregate economy is determined at industry level. As a result, productivity at aggregate level will increase if productivity in each constituent industry rises or if the market share of the high productivity industry increases and so on down the aggregation hierarchy. A complete picture of the industrial dynamics of an economy would include a mutually consistent measure of the TFP residuals at each level in the hierarchy and of the linkage used to connect levels. The task of constructing this hierarchy of residuals can be approached from the top down in a process that can be linked, likened to unpeeling an order to reach lower layer of structure. Domer was the first to work out the problem of unpeeling the TFP residual and to recognize the complication introduced by the presence of intermediate goods. This complication arises because plants and firms in each sub layer produce goods and services that are used as inputs in the production process of the plant and firm. As each layer is unpeeled, the magnitude of these intermediate deliveries grows. For example, there are no intermediary goods in the aggregate economy because there is only one industry at this level of aggregation and all inter-industry flow cancel out. However, these inter-industry flows uncancel in passing. However, these inter-industry flows uncancel in passing to the one-digit industry level of detail. The iron ore delivered to the steel industry is counted in the gross output of the extractive industry and is counted again as part of the gross output of the manufacturing industry. The sum of the one digit industry gross output is therefore larger than total aggregate output. The nature of this problem can be made more precise by observing that the total output of an industry plant firm is composed of deliveries to final demand plus deliveries of the industry output to the other industry that use the good. On the input side, the firm use not only labor and capital but also intermediary goods purchased from other industry that use the good. Several studies have attempted to link the micro and macro levels of analysis. Bailey, Alton and Campbell 1992 used data from the LRD and into the weighted sum of plants level residuals it was found that the plants with the rising TFP levels and plants with the high pre-existing TFP levels were the main contributor to the productivity growth. Firms with the low pre-existing TFP levels and declining firms were dragon productivity. The persistence of firms with both high and low level of productivity suggests a more complex view of industrial organization than the simple representative agent model used to motivate aggregate TFP residual. The micro data also suggests a more complex productivity dynamic in which the entry and exit of firms as well as their expansion and contraction are important dimensions. Let us now summarize what we have learned in this module. Any respectable biography must end with a summary judgment of the subject at hand and above all true character of the subject should be revealed. This is particularly important in the case of TFP residual, the true character of which has often been misunderstood by friends and critics alike. The portrait painted in this paper reveals the essential features. Number one, the TFP residual captures changes in the amount of output that can be produced by a given quantity of inputs. Intuitively, it measures the shift in the production function. Two, many factors may cause this shift, technical innovation, organizational and institutional changes, shift in societal attitude, fluctuation in demand and changes in factor shares, omitted variables and measurement errors. The residual should not be equated with technical change, although it often is. Third, to the extent that productivity is affected by innovation. It is the costless part of technical change that is captured. This manna from heaven may reflect spillover externalities thrown off by research projects or it may simply reflect inspiration and ingenuity. 
4. The residual is non-parametric index number designed to estimate one parameter in the larger structure of production, the efficiency shift parameter. It accomplishes this by using prices to estimate marginal product. 5. The various factors comprising TFP are not measured directly but are lumped together as a leftover factor, hence the name residual. They cannot be sorted out within the pure TFP framework and this is the source of the famous epithet, a measure of our ignorance. 6. The DVCA index must be path independent to be unique. The discrete time counterpart of the DVCA index, the Tronquist approximation is an exact number if the underlying production function has the translog form. The problem of path dependence is one of the uniqueness and this is not the same thing as measurement bias. 7. The condition for path independence are a. The existence of an underlying production function and b. Marginal productivity pricing. Neither constant returns to scale nor Hicksian neutrality are absolutely necessary conditions although they are using assumed for convenience of measurement. 8. When the various assumptions are met, the residual is a valid measure of the shift in the production function. However, it generally understates the importance of productivity change in stimulating the growth of output because the shift in the function generally induces further movements along the function as capital increase. 9. The residual is a measure of the shift in the supply side constraint on welfare improvement, but it is not in intended as a direct measure of this improvement to confuse the two is to confuse the constant with the objective function. 10. When full equilibrium does not pertain as in the midst of any lagged adjustment process, the marginal equivalences needed for successful aggregation do not obtain and it is likely that some of the increases in productivity of labor and capital will be recorded as increases in the quantity of labor and capital inputs. It seems to that whatever TFP does measure and there is cause for concern as to how to answer that question is empathetically does not measure all of the technological change in the long term. We are interested in increases in output per unit of labor resources while people are of course free to measure anything that seems interesting to them. The degree of confusion surrounding TFP, particularly the assumption that low TFP numbers implies a low degree of technological dynamism, would seem to us to justify dropping the measure completely from all discussions of long-term economic growth. Even if that does not happen, as we are sure, it will not every TFP measure should carry the caveat. There is no reason to believe that Changes in TFP in any way measures technological change.